Ah, so something's working. <laughs> okay, so uh, good morning on this um, cold January morning. Thank goodness the snow came a couple days ago or else we would have had an issue today. We have uh, Fred Crone here. Fred has been coming here for many years. He's one of my favorite speakers. And so even, e even yeah. though the, the rest of the committee keeps trying to keep you off, yeah. I keep bringing you back. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Fred. <laughs> Quiet from the peanut gallery. Fred earned his PhD in history at the University of Cincinnati in 92, taught at Northern Kentucky University before becoming managing editor of the American Jewish Archives Journal from 98 to 2007, and also served as adjunct professor of history and Judaic studies at the University of Cincinnati. Since 2007, he has taught at the University of Cincinnati Claremont College, where he's now a professor of history. Fred's articles have appeared in The Historian, The Journal of Contemporary History, Modern Judaism, Jewish History, and Interdisciplinary Humanities. His latest article, Will the Germans Bombard New York? Hugo Gernsback and the Future War Tale was published in January of 22, issue of the Journal of Military History. He is the co-author of The Jews of Cincinnati in 2007, John Fine, and The Jewish Hospital and Cincinnati Jews in Medicine in 2015. He is also the editor of Fighting the Future of War, an anthology of science fiction war stories, 1914 to 1945, published in 2011. And his latest book, New Approach in Teaching History, using science fiction to introduce students to new vistas and historical thought, is going to be published by Roman and Littlefield in March of 2024. You can tell he's been very busy. Today, he's going to talk about Yankel's Tavern, Myths and Realities of a Jewish-Christian Interaction in the 19th Century Step. Please welcome Fred Crone. You see, when you say that, it sounds like I'm busy and an interesting person. When my wife says it, she usually implies I'm totally attention deficit disorder. <laughs> but I respond with that by saying that I'm in the only job that lets me turn attention deficit disorder into virtue. In, in, in this form, wives don't count. My my Mine's aunt, not here. No, that's I was going to say my my aunt may she uh, may she live to be 120 has a way of dealing with uh, statements like that. She look she look you up and down and say that's too good for you. <laughs> so she's like one of only two people in my life I've never pissed off intention. So thank you for coming out on a rather frigid day. I um what on the surface this might seem like a rather classic topic might be the way to look at it, but. It opens up a number of vistas into uh, Jewish history, Jewish Christian relations, but also a number of controversies that echo into our modern age because it involves the rediscovery of something that we have sometimes collectively forgotten, perhaps intentionally, perhaps not, but also uh, some very sensitive subjects. Now, of course, uh, to take you back to uh, the shtetls of Eastern Europe, which uh, when we think about them, we associate with uh, Arctic blasts. Uh, I have a colleague and friend who right now is in Iceland, and yesterday he sent me a uh, text message saying, it's 35 degrees here near the Arctic Circle. What is it in Cincinnati? And I said, die a horrible death on your way back. But then I told him, and he said, oh, wow, that's just crazy. So I'm going to start with a story that superficially might not seem to have much to do with Yankel's Tavern. And as I tell my students, please allow me a digression and don't put your pencils down. This is going to be on the quiz. And the story starts in uh, Tembo, Tembo province in 1859, when Tsar Alexander II, who had just come to the throne a few years earlier, sent his troubleshooter, you see uh, Tsar Alexander II here as a young Tsar, and later on as the big mustaches Tsar, because Apparently, it's a law in Russia that Tsar's got to throw these big mustaches. But he sent his uh, troubleshooting general to Tambov province, and his troubleshooting general was Igor Petrovich Tolstoy. And I think we could probably agree with a name like Igor. At some point in his life, one of the medals he got was for strangling a guy in a bar. And if you look at this guy, you think to yourself, yeah, he's capable of it. 
And he was the troubleshooter general to, he was sent to suppress internal rebellions. And a very serious rebellion had broken out in Tambov province. And in the spring of 1859, he arrived in a small town uh, called uh, Spasek because, uh, well, temperance had broken out. People in the province had adopted the temperance movement and they had stopped drinking vodka. And this was a threat to Russian political stability because one third of the Russian state budget came from the taxes from vodka. Now, what had happened in Tabov province is these people had adopted an American and European version of temperance, which said that they did not give up alcohol completely. Temperance is not the same thing as prohibition. But temperance meant that instead of distilling grain for vodka, you are making bread with it. And instead of spending all your money at the tavern, you're spending it on other things. And so what had happened in Tambov province was that the debt level for peasants had gone down. The supply of bread had increased, therefore the price of that had gone down. Public health had gone up and liquor sales had dropped to as much as 70% of the pre-temperance movement. And as I said, since the liquor tax was so important to the Russian government, this is the equivalent of a rebellion against imperial authority. And so, as we can imagine, General Petrovich Tolstoy marches his troops into town, brought everyone into the center of town, told them to kneel, to ask forgiveness of the Tsar, and in a story that can only come out of Russia, required them to all get drunk right then and there, to drink vodka again. This is why I tell my students, you should study history. You don't have to make anything up. And for those people who refused, for those people who, well, for those people who uh, led the temperance movement, let's just say the punishment was, well, death was too good for them. And many of them were whipped publicly and the violence destroyed the temperance movement at Tambov province as a warning to the rest of Russia, the last thing the czars wanted to see was sobriety. Now, superficially, as I said, this uh, doesn't have much to do with the story, but as I say, bear with me, because there's one part of that story I didn't tell you. What role did the Jewish community of Eastern Europe play in distillation of liquor and the sale of liquor? See, we have a kind of romanticized notion of the shtetl, don't we? Comes from uh, the iconic film, Fiddler on the Roof. Most of us have seen that, uh, the play version. It's a, uh, well, if pardon the pun, a distillation of a whole series of stories by the Yiddish playwright, Sal Malachan. And it uh, describes a world that is very traditional. They stayed very sober, except for two particular scenes. And these people who are very poor overall. So they are observant, they are poor, they live a very traditional life. And in fact, if you've seen the movie or seen the play version, there's only two points in which alcohol is even mentioned. It's not mentioned on the Sabbath service, they don't do there, but there's when Tevye goes to drink with his prospective future father-in-law, but he goes to a Russian tavern to drink in Fiddler on the Roof. And, of course, you get drunk at weddings because if you could survive the wedding, that's the first test of any marriage. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? Uh, so, but our image of the shtetl is warped. Because the shtetl image that we have of the late 19th, early 20th century is of a period when the shtetl was on a decline and in fact, close to being obliterated by the events of the 20th century. And I'm not just talking about the Holocaust, World War I played a very important part in that. And so we have to go back about 100 years. We have to go back about 100 years 
And we, we make this mistake very often as students of history. I mean, we assume that what we see today is the way it's always been. We, we understand intellectually there's change, but we have trouble actually applying it to very specific circumstances. Uh, I'm gonna use an analogy for this. I'm an American man, so all my analogies have to be either on baseball or military history. It's apparently a law found somewhere. But uh, my uh, the earliest, one of my earliest memories is my mother, who was, may she rest, was a maniacal Mets fan. So talk about Jewish and suffering. Mets fans. Uh, but uh, the Mets had won the 1969 World Series. I was a very little guy at the time. And she was explaining to me baseball and the division series that they had just introduced. And she said, I'm a traditionalist. I like the old way they do it. I don't think we should have the divisions. Fast forward about 30 years when my younger brother and I were talking about baseball. And he said, they had just introduced three divisions on the wild card. He said, I'm a traditionalist. I prefer the old thing where they just had two divisions. And I said, listen, dude, that dates from a year after you were born. But given him, he thinks nothing dates from before he was born. So uh, the only person more narcissistic than my younger brother is my niece, but that's my brother-in-law. So if we go back to what some historians call the golden age of the Shekel, term I don't particularly like, but we use that. The late 18th into the beginning of the 19th century. And if we look at the Pale of Settlement, that part of the Russian Empire, which, if you think about the map, just borders on Tambov province. Right? Just borders on it. So, as I said, bear with me as to that, why that story has some interest for us. And Poland was the epicenter of Jewish life in Europe in terms of sheer size and demography, something much of, many of us know about. But it's also the epicenter of a fascinating development that comes from the interaction of outsiders, Jews who were the minority group, not the only minority group, but the major minority group, and the dynamic of Polish history. Go back to the 14th century when the Poles first Polish king, Casimir the Great, invites the Jews in. Over the centuries, Jews become the urbanites of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And when I say urbanites, they can be as small as a shtetl. And take an average shtetl with one historian did the demography on it. Shtetls range from about 3,000 individuals to as high as 20. They are the only place where Jews are a majority of the local population. So if you have a shtetl with 3,000 people, Jews might represent 16 or 1,700 of the residents. So they're a minority within Poland, but they could be a majority within the shtetls, these market towns. They are the nexus for trade between the countryside and the town. Manufactured goods brought in from as far away as Western Europe, and the grain and the produce, everything from dairy, skins, you name it. And the Jews are the nexus of that. So they're shopkeepers. They are the urbanites of Poland, where the vast majority of the population before the 19th century is still very rural. And many of these shtetls, and again, we've forgotten this, many of these shtetls are the personal property of Polish nobles, as in they own them. And there's contracts between the Jewish community and these Polish nobles, which outline what their obligations are in terms of taxation, but also regulation of life. That is to say, you will not engage in agriculture that doesn't serve the needs of the Polish lord of these private towns. And one of the jobs they do is distillation of liquor. Is this distillation of liquor. Why it becomes so prominent? Bear with me for a few minutes. So in the early part of the uh, 19th century, Poland has disappeared from the political map. In 1795, final third and final partition of Poland, Russia gets about two thirds of Poland, Austria gets a third, Prussia, later Germany, has the other third. 
So Poland disappears from the political map. And the Pale of Settlement is part of Russian Poland. And in the 19th century, Poland was the liberal cause of European and American liberals. That is to say, the, the, if you want to look for the let, raise money for what's bleeding heart crusade we have, you know, my wife and I, it's SPCA because we don't like people. Okay. Um, but that's the you know, pity the poor Poles who rise in rebellion periodically against the czars. And the czars of Russia in the early 19th century have reformed Poland politically. They actually call it the kingdom of Poland, but it's not politically independent. The czar is the king of Poland. And the Jews up to the 1860s are pretty much restricted to the Pale of Settlement, with only a few exceptions. And in 1834, a Polish patriot living in exile in Paris writes what is considered to be one of the last epic poems of 19th century Europe, Pan Tadushka. It's, it's title as it translates, because in the 19th century, everything leads a very long title, is Sir Thaddeus, or the last foray in Lithuania, a nobility's tale of the years 1811, 1812, in 12 books of verse. All right, so... Uh, you can tell here several things. First off, he's writing in Polish, he's publishing it in France, and his influence is German. Okay, you know, there's an old joke about that. A, uh, an American, an Englishman, a Frenchman, an Israeli, and a German are at a conference about elephants, and they compare the books they wrote. The uh, Englishman wrote Elephants I've Shot. The American wrote Biggest Elephant in the World. The Frenchman wrote La Mort de Serifont. The Israeli wrote Elephant in the Zionist Question, and the German wrote The Elephant in Introduction in 15 Volumes. <laughs> it's supposed to illustrate something about national stereotype. So this is one of those epic poems. You start on Monday, by the next Friday, you want to kill yourself. Okay? And it's set during the Napoleonic Wars, which ravaged much of Europe. In 1811, 1812, you have Napoleon's invasion of Russia. In um, book four, we finally get to the storyline. The storyline is of Yankel's Tavern. Yankel's Tavern. It is a very interesting story. Let me quote you from a bit of it. I'm going to, from the English translation. Hunched in rows, there sat yokels. Village wenches and the petty gentry folk. Only the steward sat alone after morning mass at the chapel. This being Sunday, they all tripped over to Yankles. For a tipple and some fellowship, the bar mistress hovered over the patrons with the vodka bottle. Hoary spirits foamed in every cup. Amid the throng stood the publican, draped in a long silver class. <clears throat> Excuse me. Seraphim, one hand thrust behind a sash of black silk, the other stroking his solemn grizzled beard. With darting eyes, he blew about, serving none yet barking orders, greeting the newcomers, broaching talk with seated guests and settling quarrels. And you see here, Yankel was an old Jew, universally respected. Notice what says he. This is the author of, uh, this is not an anti-Semite in the classic sense. He actually at some of his closest associates advocated for Jewish emancipation, which in the 1830s is a rather radical political philosophy. So Yankel was an old Jew, universally respected for his probity. In all the years he kept the inn, so no peasant or squire had lodged a complaint at the manor, nor was there cause. His drinks were good and choice. He kept a strict account, yet cheated no one. Was not averse to mirth, yet brooked no, drunk, no drunkenness. A great lover of parties he was, catering to Christians, christenings and weddings, and every Sunday he invited over the village capella with their bull fiddle and doodle sack. So the image we have here is of Yankel's Tavern being the gathering place for the inhabitants of the small towns. And I'll draw your attention to a couple things. First off, the music, the illustration here, which comes from a 19th century painting 
had the ankle stabbed. And we have an image of, and we read through the entire poem, as I said, it takes a few days. You uh, find that the tavern is in decline, according to this story. The winds of the modern world are spelling the end of the old way of doing things. Now, it's a fascinating story, and as literature goes, reveals a number of attitudes. Uh, first off, Yankel is depicted as being honest. And since he's the sort of stereotypical Jewish tavern keeper, being depicted as honest, all Jewish tavern keepers are honest. Why? If you read through the poem, and, you, and epic poetry is fascinating, as I said, if you can yeah, not kill yourself. Uh, to read, uh, he's also sober. So the image we get of Yankel the tavern keeper is honesty, sobriety, quality of service, and that includes the drink, and it's on its way out. And for a number of years, this epic poem sort of set a standard, for want of a better way to put it, by how 19th century Polish historians and Jewish historians used it as a foil. See, the Jewish historians of the 19th century, if they wanted to deal with this question, they describe, oh, look, here's a Polish man who describes us as honest and sober. That's why we ran taverns. We didn't get drunk. Polish historians, on the other hand, argue that this is just a whitewash and the Jews were blood-sucking, money-grubbing drunkards. And so it was a little bit of a, shall we say, historian's war in the 19th century. Bleeds over into the 20th century. Again, we'll see examples, bear with me, as some of these were trying for the grand unification, the synthesis, and come back to our friend uh, Igor in a few minutes. So. Here's the stats we have, okay? Jews are living in these shtetls. Even after Poland disappears from the mound, many of these nobles still have these private towns. After all, how does the czar keep control of Russia? He, like many conquerors, he worked through local officials, right? You transfer your loyalty from the kingdom of Poland to the czar of Russia, you get to keep what's yours. So, there's an old Czech saying, you don't have to call the pigs to the trough, they know when the food is there. And many of these nobles continue to, well, seamlessly move on. And the Jews dominated the liquor trade. It's in those contracts where they had the exclusive right to not just sell the liquor, but to distill it when they would engage in trade of like sweet wines. They had the exclusive right to bring them in from outside if they didn't make them themselves. So Jews not only dominated the trade, they were the chief conduit for the tax money that's moving up. Give you a couple of statistics here. You know, there's, but if I want your heads to explode, I'll keep studying them, but for the moment, I'll just give you a couple. In an 1808 census, in what was once the Kingdom of Poland, now ruled by the Tsar, in, uh, there were over 13,000 registered taverns in small villages, shtetls, and 19,000 taverns were registered in 13,000 towns, which means quite a lot of them have multiple locations. 17,000 plus Jewish families were listed as having the license to be tavern keepers. Now even I could do that statistic. It tells me that a lot of those taverns were run by Jews. That's the type of math I could do. <clears throat> so, Jews, obviously, in the early 19th century, still dominated. It is what, for want of a better word, we can call an ethnic economy. An ethnic economy. 
I mean, this is something that is overwhelmingly dominated on these local levels by a specific group of people. And so the term, that's a term ethnic economy, I think applies here very well. We think about why the Jews, well, there's a couple standard reasons. They're not allowed to work in agriculture according to local and national law. They're not allowed in many of the crafts. They are invited into Poland even in the 14th century because they are perceived to be useful. They are the despised other who nonetheless are absolutely essential to this local economy. And in the early 1800s, in the early 19th century, Tsar Alexander I, who thinks of himself as a reform-minded individual, child of the Enlightenment, he wants to reform his country, and he wants to turn the Jews from this ethnic economy into productive, quote-unquote, productive measures. So he actually tries to remove the Jews from this liquor trade and turn them into agriculturalists. So, of course, the question becomes, why didn't it work? Well, even the absolute ruler of Russia in the early 19th century has to deal with disruptions to the economy. I mean, it's a story told over and over again. Why is it, despite all the medical evidence we have, that tobacco is deadly, why do we still sell cigarettes? Because there isn't a government in the world that is not addicted to the tax money of cigarettes. And Alexander I is doing this in the early decade of the 19th century, and he's picking the exact worst moment. You see, there's one thing you can count on when it comes to czars of Russia. Their timing is always going to be horrendous. He's fighting Napoleon, and the last thing he needs is the disruption of his tax base. So that's one problem. Second problem, if you're this, well, think about the economy here. The peasant is the consumer of alcohol. The money goes to Yankel. Yankel pays taxes to the noble. The noble pays his taxes to the czar. Right. So where you have three interest groups here who are going to be against the czar's edict. You've got the peasant who's like, what happened to my clues? You've got Yanko, who's like, where happened to my livelihood? And you've got the local nobles who are like, that's my money. Now, interestingly enough, the Alexander I had a few allies, reformers in the Jewish community who wanted to get Jews out of the liquor trade. Okay? The earliest form of the integrationists of the Haskalah movement. You know, there's, there's always a few people who are thinking, well, it wouldn't hurt us to reform Jewish society. And uh, maybe get an, uh, what's so bad about temperance, some people would say. I mean, after all, in the 18th century, when sobriety broke out in France, thanks to the destruction of the wine crop and drought, what happened there? The French Revolution. Well, maybe that's a bad example. How bad can temperance be? But uh, that is one theory of history, is that the destruction of the wine crop led to people well, like I said, what happens when sobriety breaks out? So, we do see, though, in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars, leading up to that epic poem being published in the 1830s, that the number of families engaged in tavern keeping declines rather dramatically. And I'm not going to give you a statistic because... For a minute, I'll, I'll explain why the statistic is useless. But the official statistics show a decline in the number of families who are running licensed taverns. Notice the use of my language. Licensed taverns. And for a number of years, historians argued that, well, how do we explain this? The, the After all, if we look at the shtetl of the late 19th century, why did it go into an eclipse. Well, the developing industrial economy changed the old economic pathways 
and the shtetl had lost its significance as an economic nexus. But that doesn't explain the early part of the century. We now know that, yes, that explains the late 19th century, but industrialization and the changing economic pattern was very slow to come to Russia. And the traditional patterns, well, let's just say they're maintaining themselves. So what is it that explains the seeming decline of the time in which Mikolaevich wrote his epic poem? First off, laws are unevenly enforced. enforced. The laws of Russia are unevenly enforced. You see, the challenge of a czar of Russia, like the autocrat Nicholas I, who really did strangle people in bars when he was a younger man. I mean, this guy was so unpopular when he died, his own people lit bonfire fires and celebrated the fact he was dead. All right. So the uh, he was attempting to rationalize the system, trying to make it more efficient. And there's one thing that local officials who are making lots of money off of a liquor trade hate, it's rationalization of a system. And so the number of licensed taverns went down and the number of illegal taverns went up. Usually the same business, usually the same family. Statistics are fascinating things. I had a teacher just years, years ago, I had a teacher who studied Stalin, Russia, and points out if you use the statistics of Stalin's Russia from the Ukraine famine years, you see that they were very productive. Every year they made the same amount of grain in the middle of a famine that killed three million people. So government statistics, eh, you gotta be careful about them. You know, Disraeli said there's white lies, damn lies in statistics. So one of those challenges. So the, uh, the laws are unevenly enforced. The reformers are facing opposition from not just government, local government officials. You know, you have, well, basically two different groups, right? You have the reform minders, you have the Jewish integrationists, you have the clergy who are embracing temperance, but then you have the enablers, the enablers, local nobles, Jewish tavern keepers, local peasants. And the persistence of the liquor trade in the first half of the 19th century also depended on the tavern becoming a center for an illicit economy, not just about involving liquor. This is a period, and this is one of the things that's marvelous when you study history. The tavern wasn't just the place where you go to get drunk. A tavern's the place you went, in Eastern Europe anyway, to buy illegal books. Right? It was the center of the book smuggling trade. Well, you're already smuggling the damn liquor, right? Right, so why not smuggle in the books? Especially in the czarist regime that didn't want you to read the epic poem that talked about your homeland. They didn't want you to read the latest literature from outside. And so the tavern was, so let's think about the tavern for a second here. Think about the tavern for a second here. Tavern's the place you obviously go to buy your liquor. But the tavern is also a bank, the local bank. This is not unique to Russia. The saloon pre-temperance, pre-prohibition in America was the place where you could cash your check, where you uh, met your local politician, where you found out about jobs, and when you're a new immigrant, that's where your mail got delivered. It was the post office box, if you will. So if we look at the 19th century tavern in Poland, it's the place you not only buy your liquor, but it's the place where you could buy your illicit books or other smuggled items. And it's the place that where you could borrow money. The problem is, is that most of the peasants were borrowing money to buy more liquor. And this is also where we get that sensitivity of why Jewish historians kind of ran away from this topic for a number of years. Jews are involved in illicit activities. They're crooks. Not all Jews are crooks, no. 
just like all Jews were bankers in the Middle Ages? No, only about 2%. But we do shy away from this in part because it's used by the anti-Semites as a cudgel to beat the Jewish community. And so Jewish historians for a time didn't want to touch this subject with a 10-foot piece of illicit literature. And so that's why I say it's an interesting little war going on, Polish historians of the 19th and early 20th century hammering it, and Jewish historians running away from it. It's not the only reason we forget it, but it is one of those things. It's a sensitive subject. I mean, yes, Jewish communities were contributing to, well, let's face it, Eastern Europe had then and now an alcohol problem. And the, uh, the other part is alcoholism in the Jewish community was probably at the same percentage as it was in the non-Jewish community. I mean, we again sometimes forget these things that, you know, these are, these are sensitive issues. And in a world in which, you know, we are dealing with anti-Semitism and the use of the individual to taint the whole, do you really want to write the book that talks about the level of, of, of violence or alcoholism or cheating in a 19th century shtetl? And yet, if we look at it, our job as students of history is to explode some of these myths. We have to look at it clear-eyed. It's sometimes very difficult. It's a very simple equation. The more economically attractive the shtetl, the more liquor they sold. The more liquor they sold, the more economically attractive the shtetl. And whoever controlled the liquor trade controlled the shtetl. And why did it last? It was because across Europe, throughout much of this period, there was a surplus of grain. Before the 1840s, when climate shift led to localized famines, most famous being the Irish potato famine, but there were localized famines in parts of Eastern Germany, in parts of Austria, parts of Poland. There was a excess of grain production. Now, notice what I said, the 1840s. By the 1870s, there's no more famine across Europe. Why? One word with a hyphen, railroad. The railroad made it economically possible to transport grain inexpensively. But before the railroad, if you didn't have water transportation, imagine you're in Tambov province, which has parts of Tambov province are more than 25 miles away from water transportation. Well, before the railroad, the automobile, et cetera, et cetera, and modern transportation, 20, 25 miles is the extent you could do anything. That means after all, you got a cart with grain, you go out 20 miles and come back, someone's got to feed the horse, forget the guy. So what do you do with grain that spoils very easily in a damp, cold climate? You distill, you distill it into liquor. Because in this distillation economy, very simple, once you distill grain into vodka, the minute it is done, it is always going to be that way. It's not like bourbon where you age it for seven years and it gets better. It's not like red wine where you wait three years and you can drink it. It's not like beer, which has got a shelf life without refrigeration of a few days. Vodka on Monday is still vodka 10 years from now, right? Suitable for drinking or firebombing. It is Russia after all, we're talking about it. And it can be transported. And it doesn't matter how long it takes. It could sit around for two or three months, as long as it's stored properly. And so the grain economy, the distillation of it, is going to be very important. If we were to take, and this is one historian who pointed this out just two years ago, Jewish population of Russia, Perhaps as much as 40% of the Jewish population of Eastern Europe was in some way involved in the liquor trade. Some way involved in the liquor trade. 
And given the fact that Poland had the largest Jewish community in the world in the 19th century, 20% of Jews in the world were involved in the liquor trade. I mean, that's an amazing statistic for us to have forgotten. And the other thing we forget is that the interaction, that's the, for want of a better way to put it, the interface with non-Jewish society. So when we think about that phenomenon, fiddler on the roof, Tevye didn't go drinking at a Christian establishment. He actually went to a Jewish establishment to drink. And the Christians came over to their side of the shtetl. And that brings us back to our old buddy, General Tolstoy. Right? Most of the liquor that was imported into Tambov province was brought in by Jewish merchants. Now, it's outside the Pale of Settlement, and in that period, Jews were not allowed to reside there. But they were the ones who delivered it. They were the ones who sold it to their local tavern keepers. Now, did they have anything to do with the suppression of it? No, because they delivered and left. If the orders went down, they just found someone else to do it. But that is also one of those forgotten parts of the story of the suppression. Because when the general marched in there, he's a raging anti-Semite. And here's the irony. Jews are responsible for the liquor trade. He also blamed them for the temperance movement. We put that under the category as you just can't win. Right? And so that is something we see very commonly on both sides of the equation. You, know, you blame the peasants. You blame the peasant drunkenness. You blame the destruction of local society to drunkenness on the Jews, but at the same time, you don't want these people sober. That's your tax revenue. I mean, that's the dilemma. And so the traditional pattern lasts well into the 1870s. The traditional pattern lasts a lot longer than we used to perceive it as. So what changes it? Well, changes under this guy, perhaps the most hapless of the Russian czars in the last hundred years of the Russian Empire. When he comes to the throne, over 3.4 million rubles of his budget comes from taxes. And of this, half a million rubles comes from liquor. And yet, he is committed to industrializing his country, bringing it into a modern economy, and changing the pattern. It was said of Nicholas that of the, the idea of burning shtetls was one of the only joys he ever got in life. Right. So, You've got illegal taverns, right? And there's, by the way, a further irony that's worth mentioning. You know who one of the most common groups of people to hang out at the illicit tavern after the tavern keeper and the customer? Missionaries, clergy, trying to find a good convert here or there, right? Because it's an illicit organization, it's in Russia, that's where the Roman Catholic priests hung out to try and find people they could convert from both Judaism and Orthodox Christianity. Right? That's why I say you study history. You don't have to make anything up. Right? So here's the setting at the end of the 19th century. To Polish nationalists, Jews were outsiders who didn't care about the peasants. The liquor trade is profitable. It's very profitable. But you're dealing with an out group making money. You know, it's an outside group making money. And anti-Semites, of course, fixate upon this issue. Late 19th century is a period of global economic dislocation. Industrial patterns are changing the way we do things. The railroad has made it possible for some lunatic in Cincinnati and Christian Moorline to sell beer in New Orleans, right? Thanks to the refrigeration cars. And a guy named, 
Adolphus Bush is selling bottled beer out in Arizona, thanks to the railroad and refrigeration. Right. So, yes, we finally have a way of long distance trade. But it's also a period of economic dislocation. And in the 1880s, in particular, worldwide economic depression. And as many of you know, see the light bulb going off of your head, that's also the period of the beginning of mass migration of Jews out of the Russian Empire. See, in the 1860s, Tsar Alexander the Second had liberalized patterns of required living standards or location. Jews were allowed into university. Jewish merchants could actually stay in Tambov province if they wanted to. But uh, he was assassinated in 1881. And even though his assassins were Orthodox Russian Bolshevik revolutionaries, including Vladimir Lenin's older brother, was one of the people who was involved in the assassination. Who did Nicholas II, Alexander III, uh, III, Nicholas II's father, he blamed the Jews. That his whole life paranoid about his son, paranoid about uh, being assassinated himself, and started a pattern of pogrom, which his son followed, a utilitarian, utilitarian policy that his great-grandfather had never figured out. How do we get rid of this traditional economy? Well, violence, right? combined with the fact that you didn't need the local talent. The tavern, you could buy your booze now at a local store, thanks to increased methods. I mean, I, uh, one, one activity I use with my students when I talk about the industrial age, I hold up two glasses. I say, what's the difference between the two? And they usually come up with some of the most bizarre answers I've ever, well, one of those must be, you know, shatterproof. No, no, no such thing as shatterproof. And the, per the first person who said, there's no difference between the two, they win one of the glasses. You gotta get rid of the excess of mass. The uh, point being is that standardization, mass production of glass makes it possible that you could bottle the vodka and sell it off the equivalent of a Kroger sh shelf. And so what happens to the traditional economy of the shtetl? It goes over an economic cliff. Not just because of the liquor trade, but because of all the other transformations going on in an industrializing economy. And so Alexander, Nicholas, they engage in what? The pogroms. Now keep in mind, when we talk about the pogroms, there are two things that make people decide to move. The push factor and the pull factor, okay? When people say, how did you end up in Ohio? I say the push factor, my mother, 772 miles door to door. That's the push factor. But what was the pull factor? Job. Right? And that's usually it. I mean, we could make jokes about our mother because we always do. But the, uh, the pull factor is jobs. And why do people decide to leave? Well, there's no economic opportunity. That's not to say there wasn't a push factor. My uh, paternal grandfather came to America when he was only about six years old, brought here by his two older sisters, and they were running because the Okrana was apparently after them. Right? They were part of the revolutionary movement of 1905. So yes, they had an uncle who lived in Manhattan, but they were also trying to get out the secret police. Sadly, one of my uh, great aunts went back to Russia in 1919 and died in the Stalinist Gulag in the 1950s. So don't get me started on that one. But uh, there's another part about the, the, the pogroms we forget the celebration of pogroms by a celebratory drink. Right? You're despoiling and you're celebrating. It's not just because they were Russian for drink vodka. It's a victory toast over people who used to exploit us. See how the anti-Semite would use what was the traditional economy against who are now the victims of violence. Now, it's worth mentioning, by the way, that the General Tolstoy is a second cousin of this Tolstoy, the very famous Tolstoy, who, by the way, was an active member of the temperance movement, not prohibition, temperance, 
On feast days, he'd have a glass of wine. People came to visit him. He offered him a libation. He just didn't drink to drink. So he was actually a rather temperance-minded individual, and also nothing like his second cousin, who was a rather violent man. But think about this economy, right? And think about the revolutionary movement. I mentioned a couple of great aunts who were members of the Bolshevik party, right? And I mentioned cigarettes as well. Vladimir Lenin was a maniacal anti-smoker. You wanted to smoke, you're in a meeting with Lenin, you had to go outside. Well, given the fact that about 80% of the Bolsheviks smoked, that meant they had to literally sign up for the use of the bathroom to go get a cigarette. And he also didn't believe in drinking. And yet, despite all of the efforts to stop alcohol and tobacco, Russia is a society under Soviet system that had a drinking problem and an alcohol problem. Why? Because even the Bolsheviks never solved that basic problem of addiction to taxes. Never solved that problem. Now, I suggested this also not just reverberates into the present day. Think about the children and grandchildren of Yankel who immigrated to the United States. You know, when you cross that imaginary line of the Atlantic, you don't leave behind every attribute of your old life. You bring your food ways with you. You adapt, of course. You bring your culture with you. And it is a forgotten part of American Jewish history that Jews were very, very active in the liquor trade. Very active in the liquor trade. Famous story of Isaac Bernheim, who wasn't Russian, he was German. He peddled his way from southern Germany all the way to Paducah, Kentucky. And when he died, he died incredible. You know, there's rich and there's filthy rich. He died filthy rich. In fact, the Bernheim Forest in Kentucky was his gift to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. How many of us have that kind of crappy money, right? You know, I bought a forest and I'm going to give it to you. He endowed the first freestanding library at the Clifton campus of Hebrew Union College. It was called the Bernheim Library. And what did he make his fortune in? Bourbon. They weren't the distillers. And don't even bring up Manischewitz wine to me because I will probably drive you. Okay. But uh, they weren't the distillers in America, but they were the distributors. They were the distributors. They were the wholesalers. They were the retailers. After all, Jews ran the dry goods store. And even though it's called a dry goods store, it sold bottled liquor. It just didn't sell fresh meat or fruit. So what happened? Why did we forget that? Well, as my uh, old colleague Marty Davis points out, prohibition happened. Prohibition happened. See, the ethnic economy had continued into the early 20th century. But prohibition, well, you have a choice, do you not? You either abandon the ethnic economy, or what do you do during prohibition? You become a gangster, right? And there were a couple of really prominent Jewish gangsters. If you want to read an absolutely hysterical book by a man named Rockwell, and the title is, But He Was Good to His Mother. It's a story of Jewish gangsters, right? And it just proves my, my assertion that all the really good titles are gay, okay? But uh, it was during Prohibition, in a period of rising anti-Semitism in the 1920s and 30s, that Jews, well, you had a choice of going mainstream or otherwise. And one of the things that we are guilty of Humans, that is, I'm not talking Jews, Christians, or otherwise. One of the things we're guilty of is we're very good, very good at historical amnesia. I mean, there are, and I, I having worked with the American Jewish Archives for nine years and been a professional historian for a long time, I can tell you there are so many facts that are hidden in plain sight. And 
This is stuff that's hidden in plain sight. I'm not disparaging Marnie's book. It's a great book and she's a good historian. But uh, yes, yes we, for, we conveniently forgot it. But the ethnic economy changed in the 1920s and the 30s. And other parts of the ethnic economy came to dominate. After all, what's the stereotypical job for a nice Jewish boy in 1930s and 40s Manhattan? Working in the textile industry, right? On the other hand, smuggling seems to be in someone's, some people's blood. That grandfather who died way before my father got married, he ran guns to the Haganah. So he was a, smuggling apparently was in his DNA. So I suspect if we went back somewhere in the past, I got a Yankel's tavern. Okay. So, but if we think about it today, you know, there's an old adage that I've, I've never been able to find out whether or not it's, uh, it's an apocryphal story or not. I'll just give you two final analogies before I wrap up and we start the Q and A. Is that Napoleon once said, "People fear if a person fears." something, that's where they put their heavy guns. Uh, so when we look at what, what makes us nervous as Jews, when we look at anti-Semitism, there are certain things we fear. And we don't want to talk about the dishonest. We don't want to talk about you know, maybe a ways in which we have an ethnic economy. And even today, the rising anti-Semitism, this came out recently. This is the latest boycott Jewish business moment. Right? It was really useful for me because I've been going out getting a Starbucks well, my wife a lot of Coke and I bought a whole thing of Oreos. You know, just, just because and on my way home, I'm stopping for stickers. Okay. I won't go to KFC. I mean, I do have some standards. But the uh, yes, I mean, we do tend to fear these things. And you know, how do you deal with it? Well, some people, oh no, Starbucks isn't a Jewish company. Doesn't matter if it is or not, the anti-Semites are targeting it. So I'm buying something from Starbucks on my way home too. My way of being difficult. Right, I'm not. I'm not a hero. I just happen to have a Starbucks card in my hand. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, we look at where the attacks are today. Imagine how we deal with them a hundred years from now. Either we confront them head on, or maybe we have another bit of historical amnesia. I uh, I study the past. I don't live in it, nor do I predict the future. On the other hand, we do have the reassertion of some traditional patterns, and yes. In the microbrewery movement, we once again find that Jews are getting back into some serious distillery. And thanks to some very talented vintners, we now have Passover wine that really is good. So we don't have to get stuck with Manischewitz. Okay. Uh, why don't I end it there, I guess, and uh, thank you for your attention. And I guess we'll open it up for questions and answers. Any questions? Wait till I get to you with the microphone, please. What, what do we got? Anybody? Uh -oh. Larry. I've always been under the impression that shuttles were only Jewish people. No. So, like, were they segregated? Yes, uh, but it was a segregation that was more habit than ghettoized, like you find in Venice. I mean, you know, you have people live amongst people who are similar to themselves. Right? And that's why I say you have it's the only place where Jews are a majority of the population, but they are not the only population. Well, then when the Tsar tried to get rid of the shuttles, he was. Well, he was basically expelling the Jews. But not the. Now, Christians. Remember, what did the Jews do in the shed? Christians, you know, they, you know they, they lived, they were agriculturalists who just happened to live in a small town. Okay. Right. Most of the Christians who lived in those shuttles. You know, they they had they farmed the surrounding countryside. Right? Okay. You see, uh, we have this image of uh, people who are agrarian living, you know, isolated lives. Well, in most cases, especially in Eastern Europe, there were so many of these shtetls. You lived, you know, an hour walk from your fields. So, so then, if they got rid of the Jews, then that took away all of their their resources, basically. Are you, you know, shocked then to discover that the czars didn't actually have. Plan that makes sense. <laughs> Color me surprised. I mean, literally, okay, here's the story about Nicholas II. One third of his budget comes from the sale of alcohol. And in August of 1914, as they declare war on Germany, Austria, getting ready to go to war with the Ottomans, Nicholas proclaims, We're not going to drink at all. So he bans the sale of liquor. So 
He takes a shotgun, blows his foot off by taking out a third of his income, and then he congratulates himself on his end. The only thing better than that is to be bragged about the cost of the gun. And you wonder why it took three years. It's amazing that it took three years before he was overthrown. So yes, this is this is why this guy is the most hapless ruler of hapless rulers. He, he and his father destroyed the rural economy, caused a great deal of pain and suffering, blamed the people that they were expelling, you know, and then, like I said, when World War I breaks out, he bans the sale of alcohol, thereby cutting his wartime budget by a third. You actually have to, you can't be that stupid naturally. You have to study. <laughs> really, you have to study. <laughs> so I, I've noticed in this and many other talks, the common theme of certainly in uh, Eastern Europe where the Jews are forbidden to engage in certain uh, jobs. Mm -hmm. And so they are allowed to be the shopkeepers. They're allowed to be the tavern owners where they can excel. But, the, but I think you mentioned earlier that they weren't allowed to go into agriculture. They're, they weren't allowed to go into other businesses. Right. And and so it, it's, it's interesting that the Jews then because I think one of the reasons we're still here is that we figured out how to survive with all of this oppression, you know, throughout mm -hmm. the centuries. And so the same theme I heard today from you is they weren't allowed to do these things and they became the merchants and the tavern. Well, and, and think about it also from the perspective of, as I say, it creates an ethnic economy. And, uh, one of the other jobs in Western Europe that Jews dominated for a time is journalism. Well, in a new economy, a new information economy that develops in the 18th century, you have a whole group of people who are kicked out of, you know, not allowed to do almost anything else. There's a new opening. And so they go into journalism. And think about the, the film industry. It's a new industry. And immigrants of the seven big studios, six were run by immigrant Jews, right? And yet, to the anti-Semite, what do they accuse the Jews of? Well, they jumped the line. Right? They jumped the line. Well, you know, you're not allowed to do all these other things. There's a new opening. I mean, the standard joke for years was, what kind of job is rabbi for a nice Jewish boy? Go to journals. Okay? Yeah, or the film industry, or something like that. So that's why I say when we look at it, these ethnic economies are quite fascinating because it's uh, sometimes required by law. But to also think about what happened when you're reforming Alexander the first attempt to reform the Jews and make them agriculturalists. It totally disrupted an economic system, again, at the worst possible time for him. He was engaged in a series of wars with Napoleon. And also, we never considered the logistics. How do you turn people who have for years not been allowed to do this. What about the local uh, the, the local peasants? I mean, they're they're looking at now greater competition, right? Ironically, they don't blame the government, they blame the Jews. Or maybe I shouldn't say ironically, because after all, it's uh, I, we did, I did an activity when I used to teach a course on the history of anti-Semitism. Whenever there was an event, I said, okay, uh, bonus points, whoever finds out the how many hours it was till someone blamed the Jews. And Kobe Bryant, helicopter went down. One of my students showed up the next day. Found it. Six hours. Right? Jews built the helicopter that crashed. I mean, so it doesn't take much. Okay, this, um, you know, I, I really wish that when I was younger, I would listen, had asked my grandmother more questions. That right. She had um, uh, emigrated from, from Russia uh, around 1910. And um, she died when I was like 20 years old. Okay, but um, I do remember her talking about, you know, doing various farm chores because she was there. Right. So, you, you see, so, and I always pictured that the family had a farm, but it's, would it be more like just like a dairy? It's, you know, having just like dairy, a dairy or something yeah. of that nature. I mean, after all, think about Shaw and Malefans, you know, pet yeah. the dairy, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not, a, it's not agriculture. It's animal it's husbandry. Just, Right. And uh, one of my favorite lines in uh, not just the film Fiddler on the Roof, but uh, 
and actually the uh, the telling the stories is when he talked about his daughter who uh, is so happy she doesn't know how miserable she is, mm -hmm. right? That sort of thing. Yeah, that's. But again, think about the uh, think about the the peasant engages in something that is land rich and dollar poor, as we would say, mm -hmm. right? And the Jew is engaged in dairy work mm -hmm. because, after all, it has to be kosher, yeah. right? So there, there are, I'm not saying there aren't Christian dairy workers, but it's an essential activity, just like you have a chapet, right? Or you have the, the kosher wine makers. Okay. So it's, but yes, so, uh, and, and everyone had, had, had a vegetable farm. I mean, the, something that, I mean, everyone engaged in, it's, there's very few people who only engaged in one activity. Even you know, even the uh, the diamond merchant is is his family probably kept a vegetable patch. So, but it's a very good question about that. We all forget to ask our grandparents those good ones. We must have had similar grandparents because my grandmother one time, of course, we asked her, uh, and she came in nineteen five. Mm -hmm. She lived on a farm, right? And they grew hemp because they need linen. Right. So it was some sort of agricultural right. pursuit. And she also talked about having a horse one time, which she rode into town and had to come up with a funny story. So they, they were somehow involved in some agriculture. Well, think about what, what you just said, though. Hemp, the textile economy. Right. right. It's not agricultural as in food economy. So they, they you know, again, it's, it's fascinating. I'm not saying you didn't have Jewish farmers in some form or another, but you know they're growing hemp because probably a member of their family was a weaver, and another okay. member of the family was a tailor. And I believe I have a tablecloth she actually made that she brought with her, so it's well over a hundred years old now. Right. The other comment, I, well, there too. My recollection from my parents' discussion, and I'm a Richard from New York, was that because of the depression, many of the Jewish people in New York went into police and fire because, and teaching because they had degrees, there were no other jobs, and these were stable jobs. So for years, you know, from uh, okay, I, I'm a teacher, and let me tell you, stability and teaching are not two words I was ever person to put in. I was a teacher too, yeah, at sorry. least you got but a bit of talking mental, don't talking mental in here, like, you know, I mean, uh, but we're back to that whole thing. Well, uh, you know, the, again, if we go back, I think that's more the end result than the process. I mean, uh, the, uh, when uh, Sholem Malekin came to visit America, and he, he was stuck here by World War I. Um, he's buried in a cemetery in Brooklyn, I believe. But uh, he, and he didn't like America that much, but he was amazed by the fact that we're Jewish policemen. Yeah. Right, that we're Jewish policemen. He was more amazed by the fact that we still saw I think part of it could have been that there was sort of a free education. So well, I mean, not just that. I mean, the City College of New York was founded specifically just uh, because there was a large urban population of immigrants, it just the Brooklyn College version just happened to have been, yes, it was very much, uh, yeah, and yeah, Papa Vincent was one of the famous teachers who, uh, you know, historians there, and and that, so yes, you have, uh, you have an early generation of Jews, the Menorah Society was founded during, in the 19 teens, and it, uh, it sponsored a lot of education, so you have a group of individuals. Uh, well, let me give you a perspective on this. I just used my own grandfather. He was the youngest of the first three kids, all born in Galicia. His father left when he was a year old, worked for two years so that he could bring his family over, coach instead of steerage. And then three kids were born in the United States. Well, the oldest daughter was fed out to work in textiles. The second daughter got to finish high school, but then had to go work. And my grandfather got to, sit, got to go to state college. Now, there's a little bit of sexism in this one. God knows. But, uh, you know, that, that I think was, you know, but it was also a fact of birth order. It was also a fact of birth order. Yeah, like my father actually went to City College, and Rita and I went to Brooklyn College. Right. My father went to City College also in the 30s, and he was saying that at the time, he, he we would recollect that at the time, CCNY, which was, at, well, now stands for City College of New York, used right. to stand for College of the City of New York. Right. But he said when he was there, it was joked that it stood for um, Christian College, now Yiddish. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it was, it was, it was, it drove uh, the Seven Sisters College, you know, the uh, elite schools crazy. Uh, that uh, the, 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 my God, what a bunch of uppity, you know, what's. 
right? Are, are stealing some of our teachers, right? So, yeah. And the third comment I have, I guess the advantage of living a long time, was I remember as a child, well, no, I guess it was college, uh, high school senior. I was in the Boston area. My cousin took me to see a, a friend of hers. Her, the family, and I can't remember the name, they dominated the importing of liquors in the North, all the, the New England states. But they started out as smugglers during the uh, prohibition. prohibition and bringing in all the uh, liquor from Canada. Right, right. Yeah. That's one big family, and I still Well, I mean, I think about the, uh, the, the Seagram's family, uh, the Seagram's That's business. It. Yeah. It's the Seagram's family. Right. One of the biggest Jewish businesses in Canada. And no one was more surprised to me to discover Jews were in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> the only other place that really scared me was North Dakota. <laughs> Any other questions? No, oh, one over here. Uh, somewhere along the line, it, it was I read or was told that that as the Jewish people were not allowed to be in agriculture, they 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 excelled in in the trades, but but it was also because they were required to learn to read and write, and that gave them an advantage over the general population. Well, again, I think that's more outcome than plan. I mean, uh, one of the most uh, profound things I remember reading just recently was a quote by Mark First Piercy that said, we are people of the book. And the acquiring of knowledge has only been one of the ways we find ourselves to be human. And I, I think that goes back, you know, way beyond the restrictions of the, uh, in, implemented in the aftermath of uh, the Roman Empire. So uh, I think it's, it's certainly, if you look at Jewish life, in the last 2,000 years, the level of literacy is much higher. And one of the things that drove some people crazy was the, the level of literacy amongst the women population, female population. You said, thank God, what, what's next? Voting rights, human dignity. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes, but I, again, it's one of those questions, you know, is the end result the same thing as process? But that's, it, it's an interesting question. An interesting question. I mean, my uh, father, my grandfather, when he came to this country, Knew a little, he, he, his parents spoke Yiddish to each other. Now we left when he was three. You say about not asking questions of your grandparents. I'm sorry, I never got a chance to ask my great aunts, his older sisters, did they speak Polish? Because when they left, they were seven or eight years of age. One of them was almost 10. I mean, did she speak Polish at all? And so that, that would tell me something about the interaction. Right? Um, I don't know, it's an interesting question. My great grandfather claimed that he always used to be able to speak Polish. I don't remember when I was three, but in the interview my great aunt, one of my great aunts did with him, he claimed that he had to learn Polish when he was in school, as well as Yiddish, that he, they spoke at home. So but the, you know, was, it, was it a tool of assimilation? Was it just the grease the wheels of wheels the government? The, don't know. It's an interesting question. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks, Fred. Let's give Fred a nice round of applause for a very interesting uh, presentation tonight. Thanks, Fred. Was I so not coherent, or was I just amusing myself? <laughs> I think both. <laughs> I always wanted this. I don't think I should be so. Oh, now I feel like lots of trees. That is true. I think that's the good news.